Hi, welcome to another episode of Outside Ourselves. I'm your host, Kelsey Quimbera. Today I'm talking with pastor, apologist, and theologian Chris Roseboro about the biblical definition for prophecy. While there are many definitions out there and many understandings about what prophecy actually is and who can do it, Chris uh, sets us straight with what scripture has to say about prophecy, um, how that compares to the ways it is so often misunderstood, especially in today's world, and what we can do to correctly discern between true prophecy and false prophecy. I think you'll hear with some resounding consistency something that we often talk about on Outside Ourselves, and that is the fact that Scripture should point us to Christ as not only the center, but the key to understanding uh, the entirety of the Bible. Thanks so much for listening. I think you're in for a treat today. Here's today's show. Hey, Chris, welcome to Outside Ourselves. Thanks so much for being here today. I'm excited to chat. I, I appreciate the invite. Looking forward to our conversation. Well, I, I know that you are a Lutheran pastor in Minnesota, right? Yeah, you have to say it like this, though. Minnesota. Minnesota. That's right. Minnesota. You got to kind of <laughs> draw that last bit out. Yeah. Uh, and you also are a radio slash podcast slash YouTube host. Is that the best way to describe your show? Right. The the podcast. Yeah. The podcast was the thing that kind of launched me and pirate Christian radio. And okay. uh, we've been focusing on YouTube uh, primarily, although we are getting ready to officially relaunch the podcast. So uh, that that's something I haven't done for a while, but uh, oh, we've okay. been focusing on, on YouTube for you know for the past few years. Yeah. Okay, so you haven't. It hasn't been the show hasn't been posted as a podcast. It's only available on YouTube recently. Yeah, current currently, yes. Currently, uh, okay. In the past, it was exclusively podcast, and it was a little bit of both, and then we went video, and now we're gonna backtrack and try, <laughs> put some podcasting chops back in place for those people who want to listen on their commute. So okay. Did you, was it just like too much to keep up with or what was the kind of reasoning for the switch and then switch? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's about kind of defining what fighting for the faith was once we, once we started doing it in video. Um, mm, and mm. so, and then trying to, uh, you know, trying to come up with a format that would then adapt the video version of it into an audio podcast that didn't do violence to, uh, to people's ears. So, yeah. uh, yeah. It, it, it so that's kind of the thing is is that technologies and delivery systems might change but uh and we have to make adaptations and so uh we, we just kind of went whole hog into one thing and unfortunately not a lot of people have left podcasting so we have to kind of backtrack and figure out how to backfill it so okay, it, it's gotcha. about defining ourselves in the space so yeah yeah well tell us a little bit about fighting for the faith um and yeah tell us what about the show and then like I, I'm curious how you even started doing what what you do, how you got into it. Right. So fighting for the faith is basically my way of paying back uh, the the good that was done to me by Christ and rescuing me out of a uh, out of a cult. Uh, hmm. My wife and I, when we uh, were engaged, we lived in Seattle. We grew up in Southern California, but we were living in Seattle at the time, and we actually got caught up in a cult. Uh, which was uh, associated with something called the Latter Rain Movement. We had a prophetess over us, and and they had like complete control over us. I mean, oh, wow. we were getting maybe three, four hours of sleep a night because we were constantly involved in things re related to that particular church. And God graciously was able to rescue us out of that uh, through the, the the faithful uh, work and concern of uh, of, a, of a person who was attending the church that we'd previously gone to. Um, okay. She showed some concern for us, came to visit us in this cult that we were attending that yeah, didn't make herself repugnant or make it look like she was doing anything other than just really interest in trying to learn what was being taught there. Hmm. And then she invited my wife and I to uh, to lunch at her house the following week after church. And when we got there, uh, she, you know, she, you know, after having lunch, we sat down in her living room and, and she said, you know, I'm concerned about you, too. 
um, you know, do you remember when uh, the prophetess said, and then she quoted our prophetess, and, and I said, oh, yeah, I remember when she said that. And then she said something to the effect of, well, the Bible, it says this, and she quoted something from the scripture that directly contradicted what it mm -hmm. is that uh, our prophetess had told us. And then she just asked a simple question. How do you reconcile the contradiction? Hmm. And I, the first time she asked the question, I made a really good college effort to try to, uh, yeah. to sort that out. And I don't even think I convinced myself. Hmm. And then she asked similar questions uh, two more times. And by the third time she asked, how do you reconcile the contradiction? I realized, oh my goodness, we're in a cult. And, um, and, you know, having our eyes opened to just how deception works, uh, yeah. the complete sense of betrayal that you feel, uh, you, I, we felt betrayed by our high school, uh, Christian high school, by the church that we've been attending, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, when we were kids, uh, to the church that we were attending before we got wrapped up in the cult, we, we blamed ourselves too. I mean, uh, basically what happened, you know, when we were, uh, in, in the Christian, uh, high school. Uh, we were taught that we can kind of make the Bible mean whatever we wanted it to mean. Hmm. Um, and uh, and so I, when we would go to small group Bible studies, we would sit in a circle and eat, uh, you know, nacho chips and, and, and queso and bean dip. And then uh, somebody would read a biblical text and say, uh, so what does this verse mean to you? Right. Yeah. And we would go around the world kind of psychologizing these biblical texts and as a result of not really learning how to rightly handle God's word, my wife and I were set up perfectly to be deceived the way we were. Yeah. And, um, and so coming out of that, we didn't, we, we didn't kind of know which way was up. And I told my wife, I said, I think the Bible's true. I just don't think we know what it means. And, mm. um, and so from there, um, you know, through a series of, I just consider providential of events, I, I found myself doing counter cult work, uh, working with groups, trying to uh, rescue people out of the Jehovah's Witness cult. And mm. that's where, when I had my first, uh, my one and only conversation with the late Dr. Walter Martin, who told me that we needed to move back to Southern California and attend uh, Christ College Irvine, which has then since become Concordia Irvine, mm -hmm. and, um, and study apologetics under Dr. Rod Rosenblatt. So I did. And oh, wow. that, and so our journey was one that, uh, you know, has some pretty dark bits along the way, but we know firsthand, I know firsthand just how devastating it is to be under a false teacher. And, um, and God was gracious because if we had stayed in that, I mean, I, I think I'd be the kind of guy that people would be reviewing the nonsense I was saying and putting mm. it on, uh, on yeah. some other version of fighting for the faith. That's how yeah. far gone we were. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who get get so sucked up into these false teachings, uh, they end up dying in them, and yeah. uh, and 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 the the, uh, the cost of that is hell. And so yeah. uh, and so fighting for the faith, because of what I've been through, I have a hypersensitivity to false teaching, and because of my training, I also know how to un unwind that false teaching. And fighting for the faith is designed to basically be. Um, that 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 kind of Jerry Omley type of thing where we play what we, we show per, a person what the false teacher is saying, mm -hmm. open up the biblical text and then show that there's a great contradiction between yeah. what's being said and what is being and what what the what the scriptures actually say. And that has the word of God has power to open up people's eyes. The Holy Spirit always operates through the preaching of the, in the teaching of the word. Yeah. And over the uh, decade and a half that I've been doing fighting for the faith, we've seen tens of thousands of people come out of bad churches and find churches where they're legitimately hearing the word of God rightly taught. And most importantly, hearing the gospel and hearing that their sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ. Yeah. So um, like I said, it's a way of kind of paying it forward for the gift that God gave it, gave to me and getting my wife and I out of that. Yeah. That's amazing. I, um, I'm struck by you saying that you grew up in churches and teachings that kind of taught you that you can take the Bible as you want. And yet when you were confronted with the word of God, like it was, was it pretty immediate for you that you were like, oh, this is wrong? Or was that also a little bit of a process? I mean, God was gracious in, in giving the results like on the, uh, the same day. I, you know, it, was, oh, wow. it wasn't a, it was a seed planted. It was like, uh, 
I, I felt like a crash test dummy. I, you know, I had just mm -hmm. crashed against the word of God and, uh, and, and it did great damage, but that damage needed to be done in order that God can kind of build something else up. Yeah. Um, but, the, but rightly learning God's word takes it, that's a process. Yeah. And so the, the, it was a decades long process to unlearn a lot of the bad doctrines that we were taught. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then backfill it with, with sound doctrine. And along the way, you know, I, I would note that, uh, when my wife and I came out of that cult, we were still attending a Nazarene church, which doesn't make the proper distinction between the law and the gospel. It's a right. heavy emphasis yeah. on the law and holiness and obedience. Sanctification. And yeah. The, the central text for us when we were at the Nazarene church was, uh, from Christ's, uh, sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your father in heaven is mm -hmm. perfect. And uh, and I was never good at the perfect thing, um, yeah. you know, never, never even achieved it for, you know, even a fragment of a second. And uh, and it was that was a little bit annoying. But uh, when I was at Concordia, Irvine, that's when I first ran into Lutheranism and the distinction between the law and the gospel. Mm. And uh, and I had to wrestle with that because um, I, I didn't understand Lutheranism and, and, and the, you know, the doctrines of the Reformation at all. Yeah, I'd never been exposed to him. And not only that, I was really suspicious of Lutherans because, uh, you know, you know, Nazarenes, they don't dance, drink, smoke or chew. Right. <laughs> and you can't date girls that do. And uh, and Dr. Rod Rosenblatt, who was the, the guy who was instrumental mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, introducing me to Lutheranism uh, in uh, in uh, our uh, college courses from time to time, he would let a, a you know, a a curse word, a, a four letter <laughs> word fly from his mouth. And then after every class, he would go out on a balcony and smoke a cigarette. And I and I and I would sit there and go, what have I gotten myself into? The, you know, I'm supposed to be learning Christian apologetics from the Lutherans yeah. and the Lutherans. You know, Rosenblatt can't be saved. He's not even trying, you know, <laughs> that's <laughs> but, amazing. Uh, but Rosenblatt had this great thing that he would do. I, I don't know how he did it, uh, but every single class without fail he found a way to talk about the shed blood of christ yeah and how salvation is completely a free gift from god and hmm. uh, and and he would even use like scandalous parallels like you know he'd say if if, if salvation were like a, a gambling game it would be like roulette and i'm betting all the blue chips on jesus right and you'd sit there and go can you talk about salvation using a gambling metaphor you know <laughs> And uh, and so as a Nazarene, I'm listening to this going, what am I hearing? And I, I remember going up to Rosenblatt after class one time and going, Rosenblatt, if what you're saying is true, that we're totally saved by what Jesus has done for us and not by anything that we do, then you're saying that we can do whatever we want. You know, I, hmm. I kind of saw it as him basically teaching we could just go out and forno caboodle all we want. Uh, which is more of a commentary on me than on him, by the way. Hmm. But um, he looks at me, I mean, without skipping a beat, he goes, well, of course, Chris, now that Christ has set you free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil, what do you want to do? <laughs> I went, wait, what? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's awesome. It was like a jujitsu move. I found myself on the floor looking up at the sky going, what just happened? Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that, that was, uh, that was a, a big big thing for me to uh to embrace that uh, my salvation is completely dependent on christ yeah. not dependent upon my sanctification and my sanctification is the direct result of my justification not the other way around right uh that that took a long time to undo and yeah. i'm thankful i'm thankful to christ that he helped work that out of us through his word and the sacraments so yeah that's amazing yeah um, i mean for people listening or watching, Dr. Rosenblatt is kind of like a doctor father at 1517. And I, I actually went to Concordia Irvine for my master's as well, but studied under a lot of the people that took um, classes from Dr. Rosenblatt because he wasn't there when I was there. So um, uh, his, yeah, his teachings and his attitude has rubbed off on a lot of people, a lot more people than I think, uh, people realize like he's not, it's not like he's a super well-known name, no. but he's influenced and impacted quite, quite a few people, uh, for several generations. So anyway, um, all that to say, I also, I have one more kind of question about just fighting for the faith, um, in general, because I've listened to, um, 
quite a few episodes and I didn't grow up Lutheran. So I actually used to listen to Fighting for the Faith when I was first married to my husband who did grow up Lutheran. And we would kind of um, talk talk about a lot of what you had to say. Um, and your approach, you kind of take a tough-minded approach uh, compared to, if we're going to compare it to like a tender-hearted approach when you're talking about um, these things. But I also... I know from um, speaking to people who know you personally that you are very pastoral and yeah. you meet with people all the time who are coming out of uh, these false teachings and cults. And I'm assuming that you take a much more tenderhearted approach in those situations. Is that a fair, would you say that's kind of a fair assessment or yes. an accurate way Absolutely. to describe the difference? Yep, that is that is a correct way to put it. I, I like to think of myself as kind of sitting in two offices. Um, and, and so I describe it as the pastor versus the pirate. Uh, mm. Pirate is really the Christian apologist. That's where the tough minded Christian bit comes in. And I have found that if you are wishy washy regarding a false teacher, that oftentimes that will be seen as weakness and also mm -hmm. seen as a way of somehow giving credibility to somebody who's false. And so you, you'll note that um, if you look at the history of Lutheranism and read Luther's uh, uh, his works where he's engaging in polemics, he never pulls any punches with somebody who is really high up yeah. uh, in, in leading people astray. He, he reserves kind of the strongest, you know, strongest rebukes for those people. In fact, mm. I, 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 I make a historical claim that uh, I, I will allow people to correct me if I'm wrong. But my historical claim is, is that Lutherans invented memes. Um, and, <laughs> and you'll note that, uh, that when it comes to people who, uh, you know, who are pompous and audacious and, um, and are demanding that you, you recognize that person as the man or the woman of God, right? Mm. Uh, and the papacy being you know, like the prime example of that. Yeah. Uh, the office of the papacy isn't found in the scripture. And Luther, if you, if you were to Google this, Luther uh, commissioned a uh, a woodcut uh, that uh, became like a like a political cartoon. I, I like to think of it of a meme of uh, of the Pope sitting on his throne, you know, giving a, a a papal edict, and two peasants dropping their shorts or their pants and <laughs> farting at him. Okay, when you sit there and go, did he just commission? He commissioned somebody. What's to, he doing? You know, what's what is going on here? Yeah. And, and, and the idea then is is that you'll note that uh, the the Lutheran confessions, in a more pastoral and theological way, say that the office of the papacy is the office of Antichrist, mm -hmm. and as a result of it, there, you know, you'll that we you know we have to see that for what it is. But how that hits the street rhetorically, you can go at it more scholastically if you want. But for the everyday person who's, uh, whose steady diet has been, you know, Big Bang Theory and, and, uh, and things on television and they're, and they're spending their time watching CSI and, and, <laughs> and The Bachelorette, uh, you'll note that scholarly arguments aren't going to hit them the same way mm. that uh, kind of more down to earth arguments do. Mm -hmm. And so you recognize that there's that, that in the body of Christ, we all serve different functions. And so as somebody who came out of the charismatic movement, who came out of evangelicalism, I know what all the unwritten rules are. Hmm. And as a result of that, I believe that it is my obligation to break those rules. Hmm. And and so the person who is steeped in these in in these systems and the cultures that go with them will immediately identify the fact that I'm breaking all of those unwritten rules. And, and when it comes to then me not giving credibility to somebody by saying, well, you know, this is just one interpretation or whatever, and basically yeah. saying, no, the text says this and that's wrong. And the person mm -hmm. saying this is a deceiver, or I'll even you know, use terms like wackerdoodle and things like this. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, fighting for the faith is the theological equivalent then of as the uh, of the ice bucket challenge. It's a hard pill to swallow, and it's designed yeah. to jolt you on purpose. And over and again, what I'm trying to do is provoke in people that righteous anger to go, "All right, that's it, Rosebro. I'm going to prove you wrong." Mm. And as soon as they go with that attitude, then I know that they're doomed because yeah. they're going to open up the biblical text. They're going to try to prove me wrong. And they're going to find that I've been telling them the truth. 
Hmm. And for the people then who recognize that what that the scriptures are actually say what I say they're saying, uh, and that and that these people have been are, have been deceiving them when they come out. I mean, I pastor a lot of these people. Yeah, uh, we you know and um and and we take them through and and we catechize them. We catechize their kids. We, uh, you know, and we in you know I, I walk them through the process of you know of kind of like unwinding what had been wound around them like a serpent. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's done in the pastoral office. So in the rough and tumble. Uh, you know, world of polemics, uh, I take a hard stand and I don't give any ground and I will even engage in mockery the same way Luther did. I'll give you an example. There was a, a there's a lady who calls herself an apostle. She she goes by the title of Apostle Catherine Crick. And it was okay. some prophet in in Africa by the name of Jared Davies who 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 prophesied over her that she would be an apostle and she believes that she's truly an apostle and that she's leading the end times move of god in in, in the earth mm -hmm. and she recently gave a prophecy that demanded that all the old guard uh, teachers in in the christian church you know in the body of christ have to recognize her as an apostle and recognize that God is working through her. And, 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 and actually she legitimately said, and you have to pass the baton to me because God says, if you don't pass the baton to me, uh, then he's going to take it from you. Okay. Hmm. And, it's, and you're sitting there going, you pompous, arrogant, <laughs> yeah. demonized woman, right? Yeah. So, you know, what is the right answer to a woman who says, you, God told me that you have to pass your baton to me? My hmm. answer to her is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I, I refuse to to even give her any kind of response that isn't mockery, because to do so would be to create confusion that maybe she is an apostle. When people pompously assume titles for themselves in offices that they have not been given and are claiming they're receiving words from God. That is as uh, that's as absurd as it is, and they the the response the correct response is to treat them with the absurdity that they're taking upon themselves. That's really fascinating and interesting. So, would you say righteous anger is the most typical response you get uh, from people who are interacting with your media for the first? time are there different responses that you you can kind of categorize at this point so there are different responses and in the, the, the different responses are going to be based upon just how deep they are into these things because okay you're going to note that when you're involved deeply in a theology you're not only invested in it with your brain you're invested with it with your emotions and your very yeah. life yeah. And so uh, you know, probably so you your have, money you, and your family uh, yeah. and all that stuff. Exactly. And so you have to recognize that it's a difficult decision for somebody to make to, to say, OK, I've been deceived because now they're going to say I've invested. I've given twenty thousand yeah. dollars to this church. All of my friends network is part of yeah. this church to leave means I'm going to lose that entire network of, of people. My family members are in there. I was raised in this. And um, and and as a result of it, there are different levels that people are in. Some people are ready to hear the truth and to legitimately open up the scriptures and compare the way the Bereans did in Acts 17, uh, compare God's word to what they're being taught. And they will have the, uh, the, the at least the moral character and the help of the Holy Spirit to do what's right. Mm -hmm. Other people can't bring themselves to do that. They're too invested in it. And um, and as a result of it, you, it, it's very it's a difficult thing to prove to somebody that they've been deceived because yeah. they, they have all of these different psychological, not merely theological defenses set up to, to work against that. Mm. And uh, and I and I understand that I've been there. I've done that. And um, and I, you know, and I know how painful making a switch like that can be. Uh, but yeah. yet, if 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 God's word is true, then you have to make that switch. Yeah, for sure. Well, we are here today because um, we're talking about a topic that you deal with a lot. And I think it's a topic that, depending on your flavor of Christian, um, is either talked about all the time. Those are probably, you know, a lot of the people that you're you're dealing with, or it's never mentioned and it's kind of glossed over. And what we're talking about is biblical prophecy um mm -hmm. what that actually is not what you know a lot of 
uh, these wackadoo people or crazy people say that it is. So what, if you could just to start, give us a definition of what is biblical prophecy? Who, who's doing it? How does it happen? Where does it happen mm -hmm. in scripture? Okay. So when we're talking about prophecy, that is a broad category. And yeah. I like to, to like to point out that biblically you are given a very narrow definition and a wide definition. There's, there's different ways in which prophecy is approached. So at its core level, a prophet is one who is speaking on behalf of God. Mm -hmm. And there are different ways in which you can do that. So for instance, in the Old Testament, the prophets of the Old Testament legitimately heard directly from God. Mm -hmm. um, and so you think of Moses and the burning bush. Moses is, is described as a prophet. Read Deuteronomy 18 right. if you're not yeah. sure. Uh, and, and this is a guy who had conversations directly with God and God revealed things to him. And so uh, in the narrow sense, a prophet is somebody who has that special calling from God to be a mouthpiece for God. And they're given direct revelation from God. And I would note that's kind of the rarer form of prophecy. That narrow form is, is, okay. is the one that's super rare. And anybody claiming to have that level of prophecy today there's a lot of roadblocks set up in scripture that require you to test the source of anybody mm. claiming direct revelation from God. And I would note that in the uh, two plus decades that I have been doing, uh, you know, work, apologetic work against false prophets and teachers within the visible church, I haven't run across a single person who's legitimately received a, a real mm. word from God. And, and on top of that, I haven't seen anybody claiming to be a prophet today that's capable of actually passing the biblical tests of a prophet. Mm. Uh, and because the biblical test of a prophet not only speaks to the accuracy of the prophecy, but also speaks to the, uh, the fidelity of their doctrine. Uh, so if you were to read Deuteronomy 13, it legitimately says that if a prophet arises and he tells you something's going to take place, and it does, you know, uh, and, but he then tells you to follow after a different God, don't right. listen to them because God's testing you. So there's there's a there's an accuracy test as it relates to the prophecies given, but okay. there's also a theological test to the theology of the prophets who are speaking. And yeah. I would note that this is where uh, this is going to step on toes. But the I would say every single one of the people that I've run into today who are claiming to have to be able to speak prophetically, the Holy Spirit that they believe in is not the Holy Spirit of Scripture. Uh, mm. When we talk about different heresies throughout the ch uh, Christian history, uh, so for instance, uh, you know the the Arian heresy. Uh, Arius taught that Jesus isn't God of God, light of light, very God of very God; that He is the uh, begotten Son of God, and that He's the second person of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, Arius taught that uh, a false Christology that Christ is the greatest creation of God the Father; that He's a divine like right. being, but He isn't divine. And so we recognize that as a Christological heresy. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of it, we say, okay, Ar Arians are not Christians. In our day, we have pneuma pneuma pneumatological heresies hmm. where, the, where the Holy Spirit being spoken of by today's modern day charismatics and Pentecostals is not the biblical Holy Spirit. It's a different Holy Spirit altogether. And it's harder to pin that down. But okay. I, I would make the case that today's so-called prophets, they, they are heretics by virtue of the fact that they are, they are believing and preaching, in a, uh, preaching a different Holy Spirit. And so it's a pneumatological heresy, and that's as, much, and that's as deadly as a Christological yeah. heresy. Yeah. And a lot of people don't think in those categories, and, yeah. uh, and, and, but we need to. Because that's the explanation for all the people running around giving prophecies like Trump's going to win the 2020 election. Yeah. Uh, and then he doesn't. You know, how do you explain that? It's real simple. The Holy Spirit that they believe in isn't the real Holy Spirit. It's, it's a completely different spirit altogether. And, uh, and this, this is the Holy Spirit who then they believe in, it can speak through fallible prophets and fallible prophecy and things like this. And so, the, the, and these are, and the people who buy into this false Holy Spirit, they refuse to believe that somebody is a false prophet if they give a false prophecy. Hmm. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a different spirit altogether. It, and so it falls under the condemnation of second Corinthians 11, where Paul reprimands the, uh, the, the Corinthian church 
for for believing in a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. All three of those mm. would actually kick you outside of the Christian faith. Yeah. Can you give us some characteristics of, I know you said it's a little bit hard to pinpoint um, mm -hmm. kind of this different Holy Spirit that people are teaching, but what are some common characteristics that you see where you're like, oh, that's not, that's not it? Okay, so I would point people to the academic work being done now by people who are identifying the God of the uh, of the charismatics and the new apostolic reformation as being the God of open theism. So the hmm. deity that they believe in, the spirit that they believe in isn't all knowing, isn't all powerful, doesn't hmm. and, and actually can't do anything without your permission. And okay. so uh, yeah, so the, 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 the dichotomy then is going to come back to tell me about this Holy Spirit that you believe in. Well, the Holy Spirit needs you to give him permission so that he can act in the earth. The Holy Spirit is going to uh, expect you to show how intentional you are to wanting to learn how to prophesy. He's going to give you an activation. He's going to teach you how to speak in gibberish. And he's going to give you uh, impressions and words that that may or may not be true, but you can't. You, you would offend him if you said that they were false. I mean, the, the, all these things, the way they describe the Holy Spirit is contrary to him uh, and uh, how it's revealed. And, I, and I, I've even, on Fighting for the Faith, created a character uh, that uh, we call Vincent. And Vincent is the false Holy Spirit. And so the, uh, Vincent, you know, he, he would be in touch with his prophets and say, you know, uh, Patricia King, I, you know, I, I really want to get a message out in the world. And could you please whirl up your camera and put out one of those fancy YouTube videos? Uh, <laughs> I really can't do anything without your permission, but I really want you to let everybody know that there's a, that in this coming season that there'll be a suddenly for them and, and that, uh, and that they can experience a breakthrough if they, uh, if they do the right things and stuff. And, hmm. it, in, it, and so that's like kind of the typical message, but you'll note that the Holy Spirit that they believe in is not God, the, the Holy Spirit, third person of the Holy Trinity, who is omniscient, all powerful, all knowing, who doesn't need our permission to do anything. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so it's a completely different Holy Spirit altogether in the, yeah. in the charismatic movement. Yeah. OK, so it's the difference between the Holy Spirit really acting upon us through God's mm -hmm. word, um, which is what I think we would confess versus a, a Holy Spirit that's almost like a gateway to what you want you just have to do the right thing to get it kind of right and you're and you're constantly on a chain yeah you're constantly trying to figure out if the holy spirit is actually talking to you you know i i had a cardinal yeah. land okay. on my windowsill was that the holy spirit trying to give a message to me and when i woke up at this morning at it was 3 33 on my clock does the three threes means that the holy spirit's trying to talk to me okay you sit there and go no that's the reading of omens and the holy spirit through the word says no and yeah. so there's a reason why then in the lutheran confessions so, for instance, when you read the small called articles, Luther points out that the, 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 the original sin that was brought on by the temptation of the devil with Adam and Eve in the garden was that the serpent turned Adam and Eve into enthusiasts hmm. and, um, and had them basically, rather than hearing the extra nose word of God and believing and obeying it, the extra nose word of God was do not eat from that tree in the midst of the garden, uh, right? But uh, yeah. Eve, when you read the Genesis account with that, that kind of overlay from the small called articles, um, then what happens is you can see you can see how the how the how the deception worked. The word of God was given to Adam uh, prior to the to him fashioning Eve. And the word of God said, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst of the garden. That was the word of God. Uh, and that was the only covenant, you know, a command that uh, that Adam right. had. And then. Clearly, Adam had to instruct Eve on this because she was familiar with with what God's command was when the serpent comes. And so the serpent says, did God really say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? You know, and and she says, oh, no, 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 we, we can eat of all the trees except for the one in the midst of the garden. And neither shall we touch it lest we die. And then he goes, oh, you will not die. And and says and, and you can it, the, kind of the Roseboro paraphrase is, oh, child, listen, uh, Yahweh is evil. He, he he's he's really a jealous God and he's small in his thinking and he's mm -hmm. intimidated by you and your potential. And he knows that on the day that you eat of that tree, that you're you're going to become like God himself. Yeah. And, and God's trying to keep you down, sister. And mm -hmm. so, you know, and so what does she do? The text legitimately says when she saw that the 
tree was beautiful, desirous to make one wise. She reached out and she ate it. She, so rather than listening to the externose word of God, where God was really speaking, she's looking for the word of God inside of her. Inside, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, and, 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 and that's all feelings, man. And mm-hmm. so Luther and the and, and then the Lutheran confessions, we make it very clear that God doesn't speak apart from his word. Right. When somebody comes yeah. to you and says, God told me this, and it's not in, in accordance with his word or through his word, that's that's enthusiasm. That's that God within ism. And mm-hmm. uh, and they've already they they're still suffering from the serpent's bite in their ears. And, and they need to abandon all those false words and get back to the real words of God. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a, I mean, um, I feel like that's pretty unique to Lutheranism too, because even, uh, in some places, I think reform tradition would say that the spirit can, can work. They might not say it, um, overtly, but that the spirit can kind of work outside of the word or he he can, he can give you something. And I, I have found that to be such a comfort this, this idea that the only way the spirit is speaking is through the word, um, because it's a safeguard. It's a safeguard from things like false teachers and, um, things that can be really, really terrible. So now let me give you the second definition against ourselves too. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Let me give the second definition then a prophecy prophecy then would be the fourth telling of God's word. Yes. And, and so Peter in his epistle, he says to teachers, and to the one who preaches or teaches, teaching as if he were speaking the very oracles of God. And hmm. so you're going to note then is, is that all pastors are prophets in, in the wider okay. sense. Okay? okay. And so and here, here's where Lutherans are going to make a, a, a big distinction. So, for instance, it, you know, one of the things that we Lutheran pastors do is we speak in absolution. And uh, so the, the divine service begins with a confession of sins. Uh, uh, corporately, as a congregation, we confess our sins. And then the pastor says weird words. I, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. That's a prophetic declaration. Yeah. And the wonderful bit about it is, is that that prophetic declaration is backed up with John chapter 20. The sins you forgive will have already been yeah. forgiven. The sins you retain are retained. And so uh, acting within the pastoral office, which is at its core a prophetic office, you'll note then that I have the ability to speak forth God's verdict. And mm-hmm. the verdict is not guilty for the penitent sinner to hear that they are forgiven at funerals. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I have an opportunity to do from time to time when I'm traveling and speaking, people will talk to me and funerals get brought up a lot lately. You know, in fact, when I was at the 1517 conference in October of last year, I I was uh, at a table uh, having dinner with a Missouri Synod pastor, and he was talking about how miserable the funerals have become in his part of the world in Iowa. And hmm. and he says, it's the, it's the weirdest thing. You know, you, you attend a funeral and people, what they try to do is preach the, the dead person into heaven. They say, oh, yeah. brother Bill, you know, he was a good person. And, you know, he I remember that year that he worked at the soup kitchen and he volunteered and gave 30 hours of his time. And remember that time he fixed that guy's car for free. Oh, man, I'm so glad that he's in a better place. And, and so what they're doing is they're trying to they're trying to get some kind of comfort. That mm-hmm. Bill is up in heaven, and what are they looking at? His works. His okay? works. Yeah. And that ain't gonna work. Right. <laughs> okay. So a Lutheran pastor, uh, as a Lutheran pastor, every funeral I preach, I legitimately say something like this: You know, well, our our sister here, you, she's in the coffin. You know why she's there? Because she was a sinner. You know, <laughs> and, and so yep, the wages of sin is death. And gosh darn it, she had to pay that final payment. You know, and then I preach Christ. And yeah. then I say, she is with Christ right now. She is standing before Christ, praising him in the in the great cloud of witnesses. And she's before the throne of Christ. And he said, how can you be so sure? I'm speaking prophetically, hmm. but I'm it's based purely on the fact that I know her confession. I know that her sins were forgiven. I know that she died in Christ, and I know what the scripture says for those who die in Christ and where and where they're going to be. So I can prophetically say she will hmm. rise again in glory on the last day, and nobody can contradict me on this because the word of God says so. 
Yeah. And so I, I am forth telling then God's word and speaking right. it as the very oracles of God. And that's the point. So many pastors, when they preach a text, they'll say, well, one group, they'll say it might mean this or it might mean that or whatever. Just preach the word and let the text say what it's going to say, because, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of the point. And where people were always deviate from the scriptures is is by get, putting a pastor in place who wants to preach his own opinions. Yeah. OK, I, I don't have any ability or freedom to do so. I, I made a vow at my ordination that I would preach the word and the, mm -hmm. and the word says preach the word. So you kind of think of it this way is that if I were to preach the word every Sunday, and this is one of the reasons why we use a lectionary. So you guys can know ahead, ahead of time what I'm going to be preaching. All right. Um, and and tell, every Sunday, just tell people real quick what the lectionary is. Um, so the lectionary is a structured set of readings. They're uh, yeah. assigned readings for each and every Sunday throughout the uh, throughout the year, and uh, and those those texts uh, are have the same themes at the same time every year. This is why mm -hmm. we have you know the Christmas text at Christmas and things like this, and the Easter text during Easter. So if I'm preaching the word every Sunday. What Sunday would would I then be able to preach on the doctrine of purgatory? The, there would be no sun. There yeah. would never be a Sunday when I could. What Sunday would there be where I can preach on how somebody can give a false prophecy and still be a a true prophet of God? Never. There would be there would be no Sunday. Yeah. So if pastors stuck to the what the word says, preach the word, there would be no false doctrines in the in in the church because the word itself would would weed all of that out. But what happens mm -hmm. is we always make room for our own opinions, our own subjective experiences, our own enthusiasms. And enthusiasm can go by the way of either feelings or thoughts. You know, that's like yeah. God within. God is speaking in my head or God is speaking in my heart. Both of those are, are a form of enthusiasm and both of those are completely ruled out. My job is to preach the word and to rightly handle it. You know, this is what the scripture says. And my opinions just don't matter a hill of beans. And mm. so, you know, if you want to ask me my opinions, you can talk to me after the service, but uh, they're, they're, not, they're not there for the pulpit. Yeah, exactly. So if all preachers are prophets, is all preaching prophecy? It's supposed to be. Okay. And, 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 and here's, here's then the thing. You'll note that even the prophets of old, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, not they they received direct revelation from God, but that revelation oh that wasn't the only thing they had. They also had great instruction as well. And so when we talk about prophecy, you got the revelatory aspect of it, and you have the teaching aspect of it. And so every Sunday I am speaking prophetically. And the wonderful bit is you can follow along in the book that I'm reading. It's called the Bible, <laughs> and uh, and it, it, it contains the entire oracles of God. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, you know, so I better be preaching prophetically every Sunday because I'm preaching from a prophetic book from from beginning to end. Yeah. And and, yeah. and, and that and that's the authority with which we're, pastors are supposed to be preaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that I think that word forth telling is helpful for people uh, because it cements this idea that prophecy is not a new word. And yet in some ways it hasn't uh been fulfilled completely and i want to ask you a little bit about this idea of i think i've also seen christians get tripped up on fulfilled prophecies and unfulfilled prophecies and kind sure. of start to go into um really digging into this idea that there's all these unfulfilled prophecies that we need to figure out and know what they mean can you talk a little bit about about that difference um Sure. Are there unfulfilled prophecies? What are they? What are we supposed to do with them now? So the the so when we look at the at the body of prophecies in the Old Testament, there is a notable number of them that are currently unfulfilled, and they all relate to the eschaton, mm -hmm. uh, to the return of Christ and the new earth. Uh, so you'll you'll note that we don't live on an earth where wolves and lambs lie down together and get along <laughs> well with each other. Okay, uh, so you know. Uh, so those prophecies of Isaiah of the world to come have clearly not been fulfilled. And I would note that part of the reason why some Jews today struggle with the idea that Christ is the Messiah is because they they don't make the distinction prophetically between, uh, regarding the prophecies regarding Christ's first advent and his second, because hmm. the Old Testament doesn't divide them up so tidily. 
sometimes you get prophecies regarding Christ's first and second advent kind of squished together in the same chapter yeah. of, of, a, of, a, of a prophetic text. And as a result of it, Christ didn't meet some of the expectations that people had of him uh, when it came to, uh, you know, to what they thought the Messiah would do. A great example of this would be like in John chapter six, after Jesus feeds the 5,000, the, the crowd goes, oh, this is the prophet that Moses told us about. And they wanted to make Jesus king by force. Right. Okay. Yeah. And um, and the reason why Jesus walked on the water was to escape the crowd so that he can he can he can get out of that part of the area without leaving any footprints. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's part of what was going on because <laughs> they wanted to make him king by force. Yeah. Um, and, and so so you'll note then that their expectations, they knew that the Messiah is the true king of Israel. But in Christ's first advent, he doesn't come to rule and to reign. He comes to suffer and to bleed and to die. So Isaiah 53 is the prophecy that relates to Christ's um, first advent. And then the, the ones regarding the fact that he would sit on the throne of David forever and he would rule the nations with an iron scepter, that's coming in the, in the, in the eschaton. Uh, and so we, we have to make those distinctions. So truly there are unfulfilled prophecies in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you keep in mind how, that the New Testament gives us the keys to interpreting the Old Testament prophecies because Christ makes it clear that he's coming again. His apostles make it clear that he's coming again. And when he comes again, then he will judge the nations. And after that, then comes the new heaven and the new earth, and he will sit on the throne of David forever. We yeah. can then go back into the Old Testament text and take a look at those and go, ah, okay. So that's referring to what Christ was talking about when he returns again. And so the, uh, the New Testament gives us the key to interpret and understand that. Okay. Would you say that's pretty clear once you have that key or is there still some stuff that's kind of like, I don't really know where this lands or how we should I, take this? I would note that, uh, you know, that Jesus is the key that yeah. opens up the entire Bible. If you right. are not, if, if he, if you're not using that key to unlock the scriptures, you will never understand it. Good yeah. luck. Okay. It, it just doesn't work until Christ is the center of your theology and everything else, then you will not, you will necessarily misunderstand the scriptures. For and sure. and, that, and that's, that's the big problem. And, uh, and, and so even the book of Revelation uh, has to be interpreted through clear passages. And a lot of people, they've really messed it up when they don't put Christ at the center of it. And they don't recognize kind of the circular nat nature of the book of Revelation, but that's a whole other story. So. I know. I wish I feel like that's like a whole other conversation, just revelation yeah. in itself. But I think that's helpful for people to to remember to interpret um, less clear passages with clear passages and yep. to keep Christ, Christ at the center. Um, would you say in your time, you know, looking at false prophets and false prophecies, is there what's the most misinterpreted passage of scripture or of prophecy um, that you that you have seen. <laughs> you're, you're assuming that these today's prophets even have a, a you know an understanding even have a passage of the scripture. even have scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so so uh, what I see happen is more of a technique rather than a central text. Um, okay. I would note that there is a there's a passage in the Old Testament in the Minor Prophets where it says God doesn't do anything except He reveals it to His prophets. Um, and they they use that text to justify why they're giving a prophecy for the year 2024 and, and yeah. every year that comes around. And I would note that, it, you know, if, if I were to listen to those prophecies and make any kind of the decisions in my life based on them, I, I, I think my life would have been ruined a long time ago <laughs> because yeah. these 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 prophecies, not only do they these people not say anything, uh, they, they, off, they they get it so wrong. It's ridiculous. But mm. over and again, what they what they always do is they'll say, the Lord has laid it on my heart. He's highlighting Isaiah chapter 24 during the year 2024. And, and let's take a look at that passage and see how it applies to this year and stuff like that. So it, it's, a, it's a general technique, not just a, a particular passage, but the technique itself, where mm. the Bible is used as a pretext that then shed, that's supposed to shed light on the direct revelation that they're, they, they claim that they're hearing from God. But uh, the Bible is used more of a prop in order to basically lend credibility to their kind of wingnut wackerdoodle prophecies that they're given. Hmm, okay. I would say too, I don't know uh, 
if you would agree with this, but it seems like there's definitely a consistency within the fact that most of the time a false prophet is kind of trying to rob a person of comfort to move them towards action of some sort, like whether it's giving money or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, whereas like, I think the point of biblical prophecy is to provide comfort, right? Like to, to point us to Christ and to provide comfort that the promises of Christ are for us. Would you, would you say that's correct? Do you see that you're, happening? You're in the ballpark and, and okay. here's the element that you're missing. So when you read the old Testament prophets, read Isaiah, read Jeremiah, read, read Amos. Okay. Uh, if you, if you're going to read Amos, wear an asbestos suit though. Um, you know, and, and, and here's, here's, <laughs> here's how, Here's how these guys operate. Going. Yeah, <laughs> they use the they use the law like it's like yes. napalm. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so you you hear this 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 F you know four fighter jet coming in and it dro and you can see it screeching in mm -hmm. and it drops napalm on you, and God is basically saying, "You faithless, adulterous generation, yeah. <laughs> you worshiping idols and blah," and God just condemns them right. And then at the end of that, you have them say. But if you return to me, I will forgive you. I will pardon mm -hmm. you. I will cleanse you. I will renew your strength and make you fly like an eagle, right? Uh, and so the comfort always comes in true prophecy as it relates to the forgiveness of sins and turning yeah. people okay. away from their iniquity. Whereas false prophets, they don't care about iniquity. They basically, they want to provide comfort for somebody and say, oh, the Lord has told me that there is a breakthrough coming through in your life. He's going to make you the head and not the tail. And all <laughs> you need to do right now is sow me a thousand dollar seed offering. Mm -hmm. Right. And and, uh, and so they provide false comfort. And, and, and this is what Jeremiah talks yeah. about. Ezekiel talks about saying peace, peace when there is no peace, rather than turning people from their sin and their iniquity. They're comforting them in their sin, making promises for God of comfort that he hasn't given. And there's no talk of turning away from iniquity, idolatry, from the sins of the flesh and all this kind of nonsense. And uh, and there's really no reference to the cross at all. It's more like God is some kind of a cosmic genie and he's working out some kind of a lottery system where he's going to be handing out blessings and breakthroughs and nonsense like this. And you, you want to get on his good side that, so that you can be in line in order to receive something like that. Hmm. But uh, that's that. What you don't hear is you, you, you guys are a bunch of faithless sinners and yeah. you become worthless as a result of your sin. But God will forgive and pardon you. Repent. Uh, you don't hear that message. Right. Why do you think we are so just as human beings, as sinners, so attracted to this sort of fortune telling divination type of prophecy? Like, why does it keep rearing its head? Why? Why? does it not go away? And why are so many um, people, I mean, I think this is important for people who listen or watch this podcast. Like we're not taught, these people are crazy, but like tons of people listen to them. It's yeah. not like, it's not like a few, a, a handful or a few hundred, like there's thousands of people that fall into this stuff. We're talking about you know. <laughs> hundreds of thousands and millions. I mean, a yeah. lot of the people I cover, I mean, they, 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 they have channels that have a million subscribers. Yeah. I haven't even broken a hundred thousand yet, you know. <laughs> uh, but you know, but all that being said, it, the, the answer is actually found in the Book of Romans, and I would consider the words of the Apostle Paul. And you'll note because of our fall into sin, um, there isn't a single one of us that can claim neutrality when it comes to God. Mm -hmm. We are all born dead in trespasses and sins, and we are at enmity with God. And there are certain fruit of that enmity that still works in the lives of, of, of even believers because our sinful flesh hates Christ, hates his word, hates obeying Jesus, hates doing the good yeah. works that Christ has called us to do, and only wants to follow after the sinful passions that it desires and wants to do. And as a result of it, read Romans 7, the life of a Christian feels like being at war with yourself. The things mm -hmm. I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep on doing, right? And so in Romans 1, then you'll note then, that um, that because of this, uh, you know, proclaiming to be wise, we became fools and people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so what happens is, is that there's kind of a natural thing that happens and there's a phenomenon. You can kind of trace this out. And that is, is that when you look at like Pentecostal churches, look at their history. 
okay, where theologically did this movement come from? This mm -hmm. all came from uh, Wesleyan holiness stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and that we're talking, talk about a toxic theology. Have you not read a plain account of Christian perfection by mm -hmm. Wesley? Okay. When I was a Nazarene, this was, you know, mandatory reading. Um, and, and so I want you to kind of think this out in, in, in the Wesleyan tradition, the, the focus is on attaining sinless, right, sinless perfection. Yeah. And in, and when you look at the history of how this then develops in American history, there there was a belief that 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 God would supernaturally give a, a a a sanctification that was subsequent to salvation that was somebody by thereby can then claim that they're no longer a sinner that they they've achieved perfection and stuff like this in mm -hmm. that kind of preaching you're going to have no distinction between law and gospel and you're going to have law law more law with a law salad on the side with law dessert and drizzling with more law and yeah. and and here's the thing when you have God's law preached constantly at you, condemning you constantly, and you don't have the sacraments, you don't have an absolution, you don't even get to hear the gospel as a Christian because in that theological system, the gospel is milk and the law is meat. And so mm -hmm. we need to leave the milk and go to the meat. Hmm. Well, then there's kind of a natural progression that happens. And that is, is this, if you got a problem, because the law of God, semper accusa, it's always accusing you. Right. You pull that law out and, it, and it's, it's, it's like opening up a howler at Hogwarts, you know, yeah. where were you? <laughs> right. And, and, yeah. and it's just screaming at you that you're guilty and you, you're trying to figure out how to turn that thing off. Hmm. Well, here's the thing is that suppressing the truth and unrighteousness when it comes to not making the proper distinction of law and gospel is going to have you jump into mythology for the purpose of silencing the accusing voice of the law. Well, I'm mm -hmm. going to silence the accusing voice of the law by claiming that I have received a supernatural sanctification from God. I've achieved Christian perfection. I have received uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues. And, and I can have assurance that I'm hearing from God because I had goosebumps during the worship set last Sunday at church. And, and, and some prophetess gave me a, a message that God was about to uh, help me experience a suddenly in the coming season. And, hmm. and so what happens is, is that then their assurance of salvation is based upon all of the trappings of the Pentecostal movement as it relates to, you know, goosebumps and prophetic words and stuff like that. And that becomes the basis of their of their uh, assurance of salvation, yeah. which they yeah. are heavily invested in. And so what they don't realize they're doing is suppressing the truth and unrighteousness because they've looked for an alternative way to silence the law of God which accuses hmm. them rightly of their sin. And the only way you can silence the law of God is with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the good yeah, news that amen. Christ has bled and died for all of these sins and he has forgiven you. And they don't hear that. How you do theology, if Christ isn't the center, you don't make the proper distinction of law and gospel, you're going to necessarily end up suppressing the truth and unrighteousness as a means by which you're going to silence the law. So the yeah. charismatic movement is one manifestation of it. I would say woke liberalism is another. Uh, yeah. That's a totally different gospel altogether, but that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the, but what we need is the actual assurance of the forgiveness of our sins. And that's the only thing that can silence the accusations of the law. And that comes through the shed blood of Christ for us who bled and died for us vicariously on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That um, the way that you just illustrated, I think that is super helpful for people uh, that, that really anything where you're, we're using to silence the law other than Christ's gospel is a false gospel. And that's going to yep. happen for all of us. Um, and we're going to, we're going to go that way. Um, unless we are hearing the proclaimed word of God and we are secure, um, secure in him. I think that that's going to just happen for everybody in one way or another, whether it's, uh, a false Holy Spirit or good works yeah. or whatever, whatever it is. So that's very helpful. Well, thank you, Chris. This has been um, super enlightening and I'm excited for people to listen. Is there any, any place um, you want to direct people for your work or anything just, new you're working on? Just put you want to fighting see for the faith in the, in your, in your, in your search bar at YouTube and you'll, you'll find our channel. And uh, yeah. 
I, I would know it. it. Like I said, it's it's a, it's rough and tumble. I'm in your face, and I don't give any ground. You know, at fighting for the faith, and uh, and 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 you know, it's not everybody's uh, cup of tea, but uh, it's yeah. designed to kind of shock people's system to get them into the word. So yeah, that's great. Outside Ourselves is a 1517 podcast and show. To learn more about all of our podcasts and all of our shows, please go to 1517.org forward slash podcasts. Uh, some things coming up for 1517. We have our Here We Still Stand Northwest Arkansas Regional Conference coming up in May. To learn more about that conference and to sign up, you can go to our website and um, click on the events tab or look for it in the show notes below. If you've been listening to Outside Ourselves for a while now and haven't yet given us five-star review or subscribed on YouTube, I would love if you could do that today. Those two things really help other people find out about the show and it should take you five seconds or less. I'll be back here in a couple of weeks with our next guest.